Hi, welcome to Archimedes stage, um, a stage that's full of network, security, and free software. Now, up next, we have Graham Cluley, and uh, he's an expert, a leading expert in viruses and spam, and he's also part of the Info Security Europe Hall of Fame. And his talk will chart the evolution of malware writing, and we'll go back to the 80s, um, teens of the 80s, to today's organized criminal groups. So, a round of applause for Graham Cluley. Oh, stop it. Please. Oh, no, keep it coming, keep it coming. Hey, has anyone here ever had a virus, a piece of adware, piece of spyware, ransomware, anything like that? Hands up if you have. Oh, quite a few of you. Okay, has anyone here ever written a piece of malware? Any virus? Are you scratching your head or you admit it? Oh, back there. We've got someone there. Uh, thank you. You might want to just exit from the back there before the rest of you who've been infected uh, realize who you are. Um, my name's Graham Cluley. I've been working in the field of computer security and viruses since the early 1990s. And uh, it's a real pleasure to speak to you today about what's been happening in the history of computer malware and how it's got a lot more serious. But first of all, I want to take you back. I want to take you back to the old days. Do you remember the old days uh, when men were men, women were women, and small furry creatures from Alpha Centauri were small furry creatures from Alpha Centauri? Those were the days of unprotected sex. Those were the days of things like this. 1981 the birth of the computer virus. And surprisingly, it didn't happen on this, the IBM PC, which came out about then. I remember programming on one of those ghastly, god-awful computers. No, it wasn't one of those. Instead, it was on one of these. Does anyone know what this is? An Apple II. Absolutely correct. This one is actually signed by Woz himself, although Woz didn't write the virus. Um, the guy who wrote the virus is this guy, Rich Screnter, 15 years old a student at Mount Lebanon High School in Pennsylvania. And what he did was he used to share computer games with his fellow students, and he found a way of writing to the boot sector of the floppy disks on the Apple II computer, which meant that if you left your floppy disk in your drive, which most people did because they didn't have hard drives in those days, and turned on your computer, it would boot up, run a little piece of code, which would go memory resident, and then infect your computer and potentially infect other floppy disks as well. That's the way viruses spread in those days. He spread a computer game, and one in every 50 times that the game ran, you saw this message, Elk Cloner, the program with personality. It will get on your disks. It will infiltrate your chips. Yes, it's Elk Cloner. It will stick to you like glue. It will modify RAM too. Send in the cloner. Uh, it didn't have a sound blaster card, so it probably didn't actually present the song quite as well as I did there. 25 years later, Rich Strenter was still uh, really glorying in the fact that he wrote the very first virus. Here he is with an Apple II computer 25 years later. And he called his virus a dumb little practical joke. And he actually went on to make a bit of a name for himself in the computer business. He became CEO of a dot company, com company called Bleco, which you may have heard of. It's still running. And... Uh, but malware isn't a good way to start your tech career. Let me warn you right now. If you think that you want to write malware or enter cybercrime, yes, you could potentially make a lot of money, but you could also end up in jail and serving a long sentence. So think very hard about whether you really want to do that. The next big event which happened was in 1986, a virus called Brain, which did infect the beloved IBM PC. Here it is on a floppy disk. Um, in the old days, you could detect viruses just by looking at a floppy disk label. It was as simple as that. You didn't need antivirus software because the virus writers very helpfully wrote the note. That's not entirely true. But if you looked at a hex disassembly of the virus, you would see that in the boot sector of the floppy drive, there were messages. For instance, here we see a message that says, beware of this virus, contact us for vaccination. And there is an address uh, there's a, an address for a, a couple of brothers in Pakistan, the Amjad brothers, who you could contact if you wanted to deal with the computer virus. For its day, it was a very, very sophisticated virus. It used stealth, which meant that when it was memory resident, it knew when you were looking at it, and it acted invisible. It would present a clean boot sector rather than itself. 
This is the Cascade virus, also known as 1701, because it added 1,701 bytes to the length of your uh, .com files. And this was how the media often thought viruses worked, by dripping the letters on your screen down like rainfall. Some other virus. Says we have uh, the virus uh, Casino from Malta, which played Russian roulette with your hard drive. Think of a number between 1 and 10, it said. And if you get it right, you can have your file allocation table back, your FAT. That's the thing which remembers where all the files are in MS-DOS. So it already wiped it, it stored it in memory, and it said if you press Control delete that's no good. If you turn off your computer, that's no good. The only thing you can do is play Russian roulette with your hard drive. And the really mean thing about this virus is sometimes you would get the number right, and yeah, it would let you have your file allocation table back. Other times it would get it right and it'd say, yeah, you got the number right, but I'm going to screw you anyway. Say bye to your balls and you'd lose all of the files on your drive. You need to do an expensive data recovery. This is the plain virus which uh, deposited Airman on your computer screen. We have Falcon Schism using ANSI style graphics. Anyone know about ANSI? Really cool in its day. Um, Schism stood for smart kids into sick methods. And they were one of the virus writing gangs who were beginning to emerge. And there was a lot of interest in viruses around this time. And people wanted to write viruses, but not everyone had the skill set to do so. Not everyone knew assembly language, for instance. So, there were kits like this, the Virus Creation Lab, written by Nowhere Man of the Nuke virus writing gang. And this had context-sensitive help. It had GUIs, it had mouse support. It was a brilliant little DOS program, and it could churn out computer viruses. So all you had to do was say, on this day, I don't know, 23rd of April, I want to display this message and infect executable files, press a button, out the other end would come a brand new virus. And there were gangs like ARC-V, the Association of Really Cruel Virus Writers. They were based in Manchester in England. They had names like Apache Warrior and Ice-9. They were eventually caught because they went to a uh, virus exchange website and they signed up um, for a user ID on this virus exchange website thinking they were dealing with fellow cyber criminals. In fact, it was being run by the police who had this application form which said name, address, date of birth, and that's how the police were catching virus writers in those days, just letting them come in and fill in a form, giving them all the details. Virus exchange websites were beginning to, to pop up. Here's one of them. And if we look at it, it's, it's got a disclaimer at the beginning. Volatile, who's the guy who runs this website, will not be held responsible for any damage done to your system by his viruses. You also agree not to get the author into any trouble with the law, law enforcement agencies, or his mum. Okay? Here is Dark Angel's Pahunky uh, virus writing guide. Uh, virus writers uh, love to speak in leet speak even 20 years ago. And uh, one of the things he says is that virii, you always know when you're speaking to a virus writer, by the way, because they say virii rather than viruses. They don't know their Latin properly. They think that's correct. It's not correct. Virii are wondrous creations written for the sole purpose, and he then gives two reasons. Not great at grammar either. Uh, this is a virus exchange website which is pretending to be legitimate. Um, if you knew where to look, you could download thousands of viruses off the internet, even way back then. And if you didn't know where to look, all you had to do was pop up a copy of Alta Vista, this is pre-Google, and you'd find one in a couple of, couple of minutes. The big change happened in 1995 with macro viruses. And Microsoft, is anyone from Microsoft here? No, too busy buying Nokia phones, I imagine. Um, Microsoft had a little accident they accidentally shipped a CD-ROM which happened to have an infected Word document on it. The very first Word document virus called Concept, it was a proof of concept virus, it rapidly became the fastest spreading virus we had ever seen because it infected doc files. No one even thought Word documents could be infected, but they contained a macro language. Microsoft called it a prank. Then they realized that wasn't working very well with the media, so they actually updated their software to display some kind of security warnings whenever you, o uh, 
whenever you loaded a, a Word document which had macros, and it wasn't just Word, it was Excel as well, um, and other operating systems had macro viruses. And then something really interesting happened, the Chernobyl virus, a hardware-destroying virus. This is the guy who wrote it, Chen Ying Hao, C-I-H, is... Uh, are his initials, and he put his initials inside the virus. And he also has TTIT, which was the name of his college in Taiwan. What his virus did was on April the 26th, which is the anniversary of the Chernobyl disaster, it would overwrite the BIOS chip on your computer. And if you overwrite the BIOS chip on your computer, there's no way of getting in again and reflashing it. You can't put a floppy disk in. Your computer no longer knows about floppy disks. It's just a useless lump of plastic. And his virus became widespread. It was on the cover disk of magazines spread around the world. 1999. See how we're going through time here? This is cooler than an episode of Doctor Who. Mass mail-in malware. This is the Melissa virus. And it's a fairly innocuous message. Here is that document. You know the, the document you asked for? Here it is. Uh, don't show anyone else. Okay, and you're like, oh, what's this? Going to have to open this one. And again, it's a Word document. If you opened it, it was a macro virus called Melissa. It would forward itself to the first 50 people in your address book. And the way in which this virus became widespread was that its author uploaded what he claimed were a, a, a list of passwords to sex websites to the alt-sex Usenet group. And so people obviously downloaded that. I mean, you would, wouldn't you? And opened the document, and they got hit. But when they got hit, after a while, as well as the virus spreading, it would display this weird message. 22 points plus triple word score plus 50 points for using all my letters. I'm out of here. Game over. And this is a quote from The Simpsons, where Bart Simpson is playing Scrabble with his dad, and he puts down the word quidgibo, which means bald, suburban, North American ape. The author of this virus, try and guess which side the author's on. Uh, the author of this virus is this guy over here, David L. Smith, also called himself Vicodin ES for extra strength rather than extra smart. And he named his virus Melissa after a stripper he knew in Florida. Now, someone was about to do something really, really clever with viruses. And it was this person. It, well, it wasn't this person. Um, that's Anna Kornikova. And the Anna Kornikova virus spread around the world, simply claiming it was actually a VBS script, a Visual Basic script, claimed to be a picture of Anna Kornikova. And the, the genius of this virus was not in its code, because it was actually created via a South American virus writing creation kit. Anyone could have downloaded that kit, entered the name anacornicova.jpg.vbs, out would pop another virus. The genius of this was that they chose the name Anacornicova. Someone who every man was going to open a JPEG of if they were sent it, and every woman was going to open, hoping it was going to be a funny file sent to them by their friends of Anacornicova looking fat or having a walrus moustache or something like that. And so it spread around the world. And I remember when this virus happened, how big a deal it was. I actually got a call at home from Anna Kornikova's agent who said, hey, we've heard about this Anna Kornikova virus. And I said, yes, big deal, you know, pretty bad. And he said, well, would you like to do some uh, promotional work alongside Anna, you know, to, uh, to talk about the virus and maybe we can do a deal? And I said, that's a marvelous idea. How, are you, how much are you prepared to pay me to do that? And, uh, but it turned out she actually wanted us to pay to try and include her in our adverts, and uh, that wasn't... So I did, the, I did the natural thing at that point. I said, you really, really should call up the guys at McAfee. They've got much more money than I have. 2000, more mass mail-in malware. This guy is Onel de Guzman in the Philippines. And although they identified him as the author of The Love Bug, or the I Love You Worm, which spread on May the 4th, 2000. It's very easy to remember when the love bug hit, because of course, May the 4th, be with you, etc. Um, just like the Anna Kornikova case, he sent around a message 
which would work for anyone in any language. I love you, probably the most recognized words in the world. And so people would open this again. Even if you, if you got it from that cute person in the accounts department, you'd open it hoping that they were desperately in love with you. If you got it from your boss with his walrus moustache and he weighing 300 pounds, you'd still open it just out of morbid curiosity. And so this thing spread around the world because of user vulnerability. And that's a common theme. A lot of people talk about vulnerabilities in, secure, in software, Microsoft, Adobe Flash, Java. Actually, the biggest bug is in our heads. And no one's worked out how to roll an update out to our brains yet to stop us clicking. It's like we can't prevent ourselves from clicking on that dodgy attachment or that dodgy link. He wrote this virus as a college project. And what's not often reported was he actually wrote this virus to get cheaper internet access. His aim was not just to spread a virus, but to steal your login passwords for your ISP because he wanted to get onto the internet without spending any money. What he actually managed to do was he managed to denial of service himself. He infected so many tens of millions of computers around the world, his computer was bombarded with traffic as his virus kept on sending him all this information on people's passwords. He couldn't do anything actually on his computer at all. The other thing which was on the rise around now was AOL password phishing. This isn't a legitimate, I can't imagine there's anyone here who uses AOL. Am I right? Of course, right? But there are lots of people out there, even now, who use AOL. And maybe have been using it 15 years. And if they saw a message like this, they may think, well, I'll, I'll just enter my username and password. But this is an AOL password stealer. Again, they're interested in reading your emails, taking over your computer, maybe sending spam from it as well. And at the turn of the decade, the internet worms really began to flourish. We saw viruses like Code Red, which exploited an IIS vulnerability, launched DDoS attacks, very hard hitting. Even if a patch was available, which it was in some of these cases, many users hadn't applied it. This is the days before automatic updates or security patches. The NIMDA virus launched a triple-pronged attack, spreading over the internet, over network shares, over email, file infections. Again, exploiting IIS vulnerabilities, opening back doors to allow hackers to take over your computer and maybe send spam from it, steal information. The slammer worm exploited Microsoft SQL Server vulnerabilities, opening up back doors. And Slapper, who makes up the names of these viruses, I sometimes wonder. Slapper exploited, again, open SSL vulnerabilities uh, on Linux Apache servers. It's amazing how many Apache servers we find which haven't been properly patched, aren't properly protected against vulnerabilities, and are actually passing on infections to people who go and visit those websites. So it's really important to keep those up to date. And these sort of internet worms spread very, very fast and hit hard. One of the most famous was a virus called Blaster. Do you remember Blaster? There's some sort of nodding here. Oh, yeah, he's shooting himself in the head, which is one way to deal with a virus infection, but not recommended on multiple occasions. Um, this exploited another Microsoft vulnerability, and they attempted to denial of service Microsoft's own Windows Update Server. I write attempted because they actually got the URL wrong. <laughs> they wrote in www.windowsupdate.microsoft.com, whereas in fact, it's windowsupdate.microsoft.com. You don't need the www. The quality assurance of virus writers is absolutely diabolical. Next time a virus writer tells you that he's a genius, or you read that they're criminal masterminds, Many of the stuff which we see in antivirus labs is really poorly written. But it had a message in it, and here it is. I just want to say, love you, Sam. Billy Gates, as opposed to Billy Goats. Why do you make this possible? Stop making money and fix your software. But Blaster did have an impact. It brought down computer systems, which meant that airline flights were canceled. It also caused ATM machines, which were running Windows XP. Anyone think that's a good idea? Well, there were ATM machines running Windows XP. Um, 
It managed to infect them, and so money wasn't coming out of some ATM machines. Train signal systems were brought down and caused lengthy delays for some people as well. And this was happening round about in the autumn of 2001, round about the same time that another big virus was hitting hard. The so big virus. At its height, so big, a simple email virus which sent you messages with attachments with names like that accounted for one in every 28 emails. Now, I just want you to understand what I mean by that. One in 28 of all email, including all the spam. So if you imagine that something like 70, 80% of all email which is spread around is actually spam, this was flipping big, as we say in the antivirus science world. Um, a huge deal. And what it was doing was hijacking computers into botnets, turning them into slaves from which the hackers, the malicious hackers, could actually send spam and do other things in order to make money. And more, oh, by the way, this came out, the, the biggest incarnation of SoBig called SoBig F appeared around about one week after 9-11 in 2001. And of course, you can imagine how paranoid certain people on the other side of the pond were being at that time. And when a virus struck, it had to be Al-Qaeda. Osama bin Laden was in his little cave in Afghanistan writing viruses. That was the fear at the time, but no, that was nonsense. But more malware was taking over computers, turning them into botnets and so forth. Names like Bagel, Mitob. Bagel and Mitob were actually in a war with each other. They were trying to fight each other. They would come across infections of each other on a computer and try and knock the lights out of the other one and wrestle control of that, virus, of that computer from one botnet into another botnet. They were using your computers as a battleground. The Netsky virus, written by German teenager Sven Yashin, uh, who also wrote the Sasser Internet Worm, Brido Lab, Mariposa, uh, the Spanish for butterfly. Lots and lots of botnets were being created, infecting computer systems, hijacking them. So millions of computers around the world were hijacked under the control of hackers. This is just some of the places in which uh, we found Brido Lab, for instance. And each one of those could be thousands and thousands of computers. So next time you receive a piece of spam, realize this. It wasn't sent to you from the spammer's own computer. They actually send you viruses from your Auntie Agatha's computer. It's your great aunt who's spewing out all the Viagra ads, all the fake insurance, all the fake doctorates, all those other messages. And they don't even realize they're doing it. Their computer in the background is churning out all this stuff because it's been hijacked into a botnet. So the millions of computers around the world continue to be infected and compromised and under the control of malicious hackers. And they can use those computers to send spam. They can make money from them by displaying pop-up adverts or, or installing adware or scareware, which is when they display fake security warnings. Um, maybe you've had your, your browser, whether it be Chrome or Firefox or Internet Explorer, have some sort of browser add-on added. And maybe your search results are going somewhere else. All ways of making money for the cyber criminals. The good news is the authorities weren't completely ignoring this problem. So people were being arrested. In some cases, people were being sent to jail for significant amounts of time. But some of these guys were making millions of dollars from these compromised computers. And these are just some of the examples. Um, one of the most notorious is Zbot, also known as Zeus continues to be a problem today. A banking Trojan horse will, has programmed into it the details of many online banks and will try and steal your online passwords, very sophisticated pieces of malicious software. The problem is, well, what does a, an infected computer look like? Let me show you. It looks like this. This is an infected computer right now. Um, and as you can see, with the naked eye, it's not possible to tell it's infected. In the old days, malware was very visual. It would display 
a, dr a skull dripping in blood on your screen. It would have 256 color palette cycling, like the phantom worm. You would have green caterpillars going across the screen, eating up your letters and pooing them out brown the other side. Even the guys in the accounts department would know that something was up with their computer when it got hit by something like that. But now, viruses didn't draw attention to themselves, and they also didn't slow down your computer either because everyone's got a decent CPU, everyone's got decent internet access in comparison to the dial-up days. So your computer might be infected with malware without you realizing it's happening. Malware had changed. It was no longer electronic graffiti. It was no longer interested in drawing attention to itself. The old virus writers had names like Apache Warrior, Ice Nine, Slarty Bartfast, um, my personal favorite uh, was called Colostomy Bag Boy. Um, charming fellow, wouldn't necessarily want to have lunch with him. And, but they, they had these grandiose names, not because they were members of the World Wrestling Federation, but because maybe they wanted to create an aura of themselves online. And so they would have the kind of grandiose, evil name. But if you met them in the flesh, maybe they were in their back bedrooms eating pizza and needing a little bit more vitamin D. Malware now, though, wasn't interested in drawing attention to itself. They wouldn't include their address like the brain virus did. Wouldn't do things like that. It was secretive. It was stealing. It was spying. And it was about to get really, really targeted. And this is a big problem, targeted malware. Many of the viruses we've already spoken about made their presence known because they infected millions of computers worldwide. And it was hard to ignore. Even the worst antivirus company in the world would know that Code Red or the Blaster Worm or So Big was spreading because it was everywhere. But if you have a targeted attack, if you're only interested in infecting one or two people at a particular organization, how is the antivirus company ever going to know about it? How are they going to be able to protect, them, protect you against those kind of threats? It's a real challenge. And I'm going to show you one example of a targeted attack. This guy here is Mahmoud al Mabhu. Does anyone know who he is? Well, he was a senior official in Hamas. And he was murdered uh, in a Dubai hotel by an assassination team a few years ago. You might remember them. They dressed up as tennis players. There they are. This is CCTV footage. If you actually want to go on YouTube, you can watch the whole hotel CCTV footage of these guys turning up with their tennis bags, going to the hotel room of that Hamas guy, and then leaving afterwards. And as was reported at the time, that Hamas official was murdered by people working for Mossad, the, the Israeli secret service. Now, what's interesting is the Israelis were able to track that Hamas official's whereabouts and his activities because they had managed to infect his laptop with malware, which was spying on him. Now, if that's not a lesson to be really careful about leaving your laptop in a hotel room when you check out and not worrying about the maid who's coming to clean up your computer and what she might do with your laptop, I don't know what is. But there have been a number of occasions. There was another occasion as well uh, in a London hotel where the Israeli Secret Service managed to steal information from a Syrian diplomat's uh, computer about the activities and military activities and uh, a, a missile area which they had in Syria. And they were subsequently able to launch a military attack against it with fighter jets, all as the result of sending in a cleaning lady into a hotel room where a laptop was. So make sure your laptop is properly protected with a strong password, but more than that, has strong full disk encryption so someone can't access the data on it. And this is the country of Georgia. Uh, Georgia, which um, doesn't always get on that well with Russia, uh, from what I've heard. And what happened was there was a big... Uh, attack going on against Georgian computers, the Georgian government computers. 
And the way in which they managed to infect Georgian government computers was they set up what are known as watering holes. And this is where hackers break into a website and place some malicious script on the website, which would be of interest. So here, for instance, this is a Georgian news website. And what we have here is a, a small piece of script which has been injected into the HTML code. So if you visited that computer, sorry, that website on your computer, you would also be running this little bit of script as well from a third party site. And that piece of script would be exploiting vulnerabilities, which maybe your computer isn't patched against. Maybe there are zero day vulnerabilities designed to infect your computer and plant malware on it for the purposes of spying. Here's another example of the same thing, another Georgian website, same thing going on. There's a piece of malicious code which has been injected into the website. You can see the importance of keeping your website up to date with security patches now. Even if it's not affecting you, it could be affecting your readers, your website visitors. Now what was interesting was the piece of malware that was being installed could access the computers it infected, could steal Word documents, it could do key login, which meant that they could steal passwords as they were entered in, they could see everything on the screen, and they could also take over the webcam, which meant they could actually view government officials sat at their computers and listen to them as well through the webcam microphone, something that's quite possible to do with malware. But what was really clever was that the Georgians decided to launch a counterattack. They realized they were being hit in this way. So what they did was they created a file and they called it this, Georgian NATO agreement.zip. And they put it on some computers which they knew to be infected, which they knew the hacker was scooping information off, and they thought, we'll give it that name, he won't be able to resist. And what they did was they planted an adapted version of the hacker's own malware inside the zip file. Which meant when the hacker downloaded the zip file and opened its contents and accessed them, it was his webcam which was actually being taken over. So it is now child's play for the Georgian authorities to actually capture images of the hacker sat in front of his computer, and they actually recorded him as he panicked and suddenly noticed his webcam light was on and ripped it out and wiped his hard drive. But they had already gathered enough information about this to locate his IP address and through GIO IP lookup, able to work out where in the world this hacker was. Where in the world could this hacker be? Let's take a look. Well, it's a street. Um, yep, it's a street, looks like Russian writing there. It's actually Moscow, and the actual address where this hacker was, the building where this hacker was, just happens to be on the opposite side of the street from the FSB headquarters. The FSB is the new revamped version of the KGB, it's a bit like Labour and New Labour, they've rebranded themselves. So, directly opposite the KGB headquarters was this hacker who was breaking into Georgian computers and stealing information. It's a wonderful story of how sometimes the tables can be turned on a hacker. Here's another example, probably the most famous piece of state-sponsored malware, Stuxnet. Stuxnet was designed to infiltrate a uh, nuclear enrichment facility in the city of Natanz in uh, Iran, and it was hit by this very targeted piece of malware, using, exploiting zero-day vulnerabilities that no one had ever seen before, a whole variety of them, very sophisticated piece of malware, and what it was designed to do was take over industrial systems, mess around with them, change their configuration and calibration, and actually ultimately cause physical damage to the nuclear enrichment facility in the hope of disrupting uh, the uh, plans of Iran to build a nuclear weapon. So very, very sophisticated. Who would have any interest in doing that? It's not going to be your regular organized cyber criminal. You're not going to make money from doing this. Well, the truth came out. It was these chaps. Uh, these chaps are called the United States of America. 
And this program, this secret project known as Operation Olympic Games, was started by George W. Bush and was then continued by uh, Barack Obama. And they decided the best way they could find out what was going on inside that plant was to infect it with malware and try and disrupt its activities by actually writing this very sophisticated piece of malware. And in fact, they were so afraid that Israel might actually take preemptive action against this nuclear facility, they brought Israel into the scheme. And they told Israel about it, and they worked alongside the Americans because obviously the Americans didn't want them launching a military attack which could inflame the situation in the Middle East. So another example of state-sponsored espionage with very real action. Some countries even use malware to spy on their own citizens. Here is the uh, Bundestrojener, apologies if you're German at my accent, also known as R2D2 because it has a little bit of code inside it, so in C3PO R2D2. This was uncovered by the Chaos Computer Club in Germany, and what the German authorities had done was they had infected a laptop. You know when you, you go through customs, um, or you go through uh, security at a, an airport, and maybe you have to give your computer to someone, they have the right to search your computer. In this particular case, the authorities actually planted a piece of malware on a party's computer, hoping to gather information as to what he was doing on the internet. And we've seen this done other times as well. We've seen the FBI, for instance, investigate, um, I think it's the Scarpadimo family, the mafia families in America, using malware like this, sort of e-bugging. So right now, authorities were realizing that they could use some of the techniques used by criminals to steal information and make money. They could use it actually to help them in law enforcement as well. And there are many, many examples of malware and state-sponsored cybercrime occurring. So we've seen foreign government uh, being blamed by the United States for stealing secret Pentagon plans. We've got MI5 chiefs saying there's an enormous amount of this going on. We've seen hackers breaking into submarine stations. We saw Google a few years ago point a finger very much uh, towards uh, China saying that they were responsible for breaking into their systems and gathering information about dissidents. So there, my view is that there's probably not a sophisticated country in the world which isn't using the internet to spy on both its enemies and maybe its friends as well. Because why wouldn't you use the internet to spy? Using the internet to spy on other countries is going to be cheaper than sending some team in, you know, undercover, parachuting in James Bond style to steal the microfilm. But furthermore, it's also a lot less politically embarrassing and it's a lot less damaging in terms of PR. There's no danger of anyone dying on this mission if you send the malware from Whitehall itself. And also, you can deny responsibility. It's very easy for countries to say, well, Although you say it came from our country, that doesn't mean it was endorsed by the People's Liberation Army or our government or our secret services. It could have just been a politically minded hacker in our country having an IP address here who decided he wanted to do one. He wanted to launch an attack, rather like hacktivism. So hacktivism, you know, no one would say, oh, America has done this. America has attacked Sony's websites when Anonymous or Lulzsec are talk attack a Sony website, it's the same thing. So it's very easy to claim no responsibility and say nothing to do with us. And it's very, very difficult to prove that a country really was behind an internet attack. But it's something which we're seeing more and more accusations of, and every day there seems to be another report of one country spying on another, using malware, using the internet. Just this morning, I saw this on BBC News. Brazil and Mexico are having a go at America, saying that their president's private communications were being intercepted by the Americans. And of course, you're all familiar with Edward Snowden and the PRISM project uh, being run by the NSA and so forth. So there's lots of allegations of this sort of thing going on. And that's why I would say if you're using the internet today, you need to protect yourself. You need to be private. You need to use VPNs. Uh, rather than just open it, accessing open Wi-Fi. You need to have properly, proper encryption 
on your communications if you're worried about someone else getting to see them. So, where are we today? I remember as a young lad, yes, I was a young lad before I became a rather tubby middle-aged lad. Um, I remember thinking, wow, I'm going to be alive in 2001. That's going to be awesome because I've seen the Stanley Kubrick movie. I know what to Now we're in 2014. My dreams changed somewhat. Uh, if you're of a certain age, you may even remember this TV show of the 70s. But um, that's what I thought it was going to be. So what's the situation today? Well, it's been a long road. We started off with hobbyists, writing viruses, uh, coding malware for fun, for the intellectual challenge. Sometimes they were destructive, but if you had a backup, you could always recover. Everyone had backups, right? Everyone now has backups. Of course we do. We back up everything multiple times, offline, online, under the bed, etc. So we didn't have to worry too much. But most of it was being done really to prove a point, to show off there wasn't any financial motivation. Then we saw organized cyber criminals writing masses of viruses. Every day, we see over 100,000 new Trojan horses and other kinds of malware being pumped out. Most of it is designed to make money, to steal your personal information, compromise you into a botnet. Most recently, we saw the hacktivists. It's kind of a throwback to the early hobbyists, people who didn't have a financial reason often for doing these things, but wanted to prove a point or wanted to expose poor security or simply had an agenda against a particular organization. And so there are embarrassments and there are defacements, there are DDoS attacks and so forth. But now we've got countries involved as well. They don't seem to care about it. Uh, about the legality of this, they're going to do it regardless because they're above the law. So what countries aren't using malware and other technologies to spy upon their citizens? I suspect it's going to be quite a low percentage and which wouldn't be tempted to use the internet next time they go to the war. There's a lot of very hawkish behavior going on. A lot of people are, are talking up the threat of cyber attacks from other countries. The truth is, everybody's at it. And we have to be a little bit careful because I say it's very difficult to prove that one particular nation was behind an internet attack. So there are the risks um, that people could launch an attack the wrong way. But what a long way we've come from Elk Cloner, the program with a personality. It will stick to you like glue. It will modify RAM to send in the cloner. Remember him, Rich Skrenter, don't be fooled into thinking that every malware author is going to have a happy ending. He was lucky. He did what he did largely before the world of computer crime laws came in. Now computer crime is taken extremely seriously by the authorities and the penalties are severe. You can make money through cybercrime, but don't do it. The truth is there's a much bigger intellectual challenge involved in writing security software, making systems secure, writing antivirus software, and uh, the challenges which come with that. And there's a far higher quality, I think, going on actually there. Um, but that's a whole different presentation. Uh, so I won't tell you how to write an antivirus today, but we can do that some other time. We do have time for some questions, uh, but those are my contact details if anyone wants to get in touch with me and ask some more. But um, the guy who wrote viruses earlier on, but has recovered since, has got his hand up. Question from you. I think someone's going to come to you with a microphone. Or not. Pass it along. Run like the wind. <laughs> right, hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, uh, have you heard of uh, the Tinsy, the ARM chip? Um, it's about the size of my thumb, and uh, it can be programmed to basically take over an organization by using PowerShell. Surely the threat can come from within, knowing a neighbor or someone who knows, knows an organization by disguising it as a mouse or something like that, as a USB device, without having a trusted product mo module inside it. 
you know, we have having to look closer, surely, if we're at physical devices, much more under the spotlight. Do you agree? Or what's your view on that? Well, I, I think what you raise is a very interesting point, which is the insider threat. There is a lot of focus put on external hackers and so forth. There's actually a much more complicated problem of the internal threat, disgruntled employees, people who've come in, maybe on a temporary work basis, maybe to steal information. Once they're inside your organization, if they have a user ID and password, if they're being given free reign to plug devices in, then there is the risk of a lot of data being stolen, uh, fake Wi-Fi hotspots, and all kinds of nastiness like that. So th th there are a great deal of risks like that. We, I spoke briefly about key login devices, key login malware. Key login malware can be detected by up-to-date antivirus software. But there are very simple devices like key login hardware, which just plug into the back of your USB port in the back of your computer, where your keyboard plugs in, maybe no bigger than a thumbnail, and that's actually capturing every key press you make, including your passwords, and there's no antivirus which can detect that. You can only detect it by looking. And we've seen situations where, for instance, at libraries, where public access computers, someone's come in, planted those, grabbed loads of passwords for all kinds of accounts, and then spirited away and no one knows who's, who's actually done it and stolen the information. So the insider threat is a considerable one, and there are all kinds of ways, if you have a bad egg inside your organization, they can cause trouble. Any other questions? There's one behind you up there. Thank you. Do you think that given that intelligence agencies and other organizations may have access to the companies which write software, that write operating systems on low-level code and can compel these organizations to give important secrets so they can develop better malware to be used as weapons effectively, gives the intelligence agencies and other actors an edge over the, uh, the people who are trying to defend against malware, the, the good guys, so to speak? Um. All I can tell you is that I've been working for antivirus developers for over 20 years now, and I've never experienced that problem myself, of the authorities coming in saying, we want to work out exactly how your engine works so we can try and write malware to, to defeat it. If they did try and write a piece of malware, and they have done, right? There have been pieces of malware which we believe have been written by the intelligence services. It's not like they say copyright MI5 in them. But you know, there, there are reasons to believe, OK, it looks like that's probably what's going on here. They don't seem to be any better at avoiding detection than the 100,000 other pieces of malware we see every single day. No more sophisticated. What does happen, however, is that intelligence agencies have quite a big budget. And so they are able to pay people much more for zero-day vulnerabilities and exploits, which they could embed into their code to help it spread, to help it infect people in a targeted attack, than, for instance, Microsoft or Google would be able to pay. And there are firms out there who find vulnerabilities in popular software and will basically sell it to the highest bidder. And I think that's actually a much greater threat than them getting the source code of an antivirus program and trying to work it out. because. You know, we're in a state of constant development and refinement, and if we find something which we feel we should be detecting but aren't, we simply update our products and rework it. We've had a number of challenges over the year of brand new types of malware using stealth, polymorphism, server-side polymorphism, um, uh, 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 rootkits, and so forth, which we've had to deal with in the past. Any other questions? Yes. You just tell me, and I'll repeat it. I was just wondering, like, um, in terms of, uh, like, most sort of virus and malware scanning involves actually getting a fingerprint of the malware and the virus itself. Do you know if anybody's actually thought of, um, of sort of basically taking a fingerprint of the activity of it? Okay. So almost in a big data sort of way, trying to recognize yeah. the so the question is, sorry if you didn't hear that, the question is, um, most antivirus software takes a fingerprint of the file. Are there any solutions out there which actually look at the behavior? which, uh, as it actually takes place, in fact, most antiviruses these days do have that kind of capability. So they will have, fingerprint is probably the wrong word, um, but they do have ways of detecting uh, the malicious code and identifying its particular piece of malicious code. It's much more sophisticated than a grep, by the way. You know, we've, we're 20 years beyond that um, in how we do it. But 
In addition, there are sort of behavioral analysis components of most modern antiviruses these days, which will detect, hang on, this piece of code appears to be going memory resident in a strange way, appears to be accessing lots of files, and can try and intercept it. The problem with those sort of solutions is often the one of false alarms and making mistakes and identifying the wrong thing. But I think over the last 10 years, most products have got a lot better at that. It is always going to be possible to write, an uh, write a piece of malware which the current antiviruses don't detect. There is no such thing as a perfect antivirus. That, I'm afraid, is why you need to constantly update it and apply those security patches to defeat these things and, and, and to keep on top of the problem. But um, yeah, it's something that's been thought about. I don't think in isolation, any one technique is the best way to stop malware getting on your computer. You actually need a layered defense. Right, so the question is, can you actually watch what a user is doing, their user's behavior and the packets going out and the, the various things? Again, there are solutions which look at that kind of behavior. It's a very hard thing. Um, one of the things which some solutions actually do is they, they actually generate, I'm going to use the word now, a fingerprint for normal user behavior over a time. For, for users you trust, and then you apply that policy over your organization. And if people begin to switch or veer away from it dramatically, you can begin to alert. Uh, for instance, products I'm familiar with can detect if a, if a database file is being copied onto a, a USB stick and it contains credit card numbers or people's personal information, it could send out an alert on that. You could detect if files are being sent to a Yahoo or Gmail account which contain confidential information. So there are ways of looking for that kind of information as it's going on. But if someone is really, really determined, it's very hard to prevent illegal behavior. It's always about trying to control it and keep it to a minimum. Stu. Go on, give him a mic. <laughs> uh, looking to the future, what would be your advice to the police and to journalists? To police and to journalists? Oh, because of hacking. <coughs> yes. Um, I think the police are, are, are doing a reasonably good job at this. Actually, they're working more internationally with each other. They're sharing information. The problem largely with uh, the authorities investigating cybercrime is that they're under-resourced. And the problem is that people aren't reporting cybercrime. If just about everyone here said they'd had a piece of spyware or adware on their computer or something like this, my guess is that none of you went and told the police, right? Because you'd think, why would we tell the police about that? But a crime was committed. And if we don't count the number of crimes which committed, the police are never going to have the data and the statistics to prove that they need to be resourced better to deal with the rising problem of cybercrime. So it's a bit chicken and egg, this. Um, with journalists, there's certainly been a lot of journalists, I mean, News International obviously have uh, blotted their copybook somewhat um, by hacking into systems in the desire for sleazy celebrity stories. Um, I think journalists can't be given a green card to go around hacking and can't be given a green card to go around exploiting vulnerabilities. Um, sometimes journalists have done some very shady stuff on the internet, which we in the computer security industry have sort of stepped back on. There have been times when we've been able to access web servers which we know are controlled by criminals, but we realize that us actually accessing it commits a crime as well. So that kind of information is, is something we have to do. I'm being given the guillotine. But thank you very much uh, for coming today. I really appreciate it. And thank you to the, the guys uh, here at the O2 for putting on such a fantastic uh, event as the campus party as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Graham. Thank you. That was a really engaging talk on cybercrime. Um, so now um, we'll have a five-minute break. Um, at the moment, at the O2 main stage, there'll be uh, there's a last-minute submission. It's Ruth Barnett, and she'll be talking about how SwiftKey became the biggest paid Android app in the world. So if you'd like to go see that, um, it's just down there. But thank you. Thank you very much.